my name is Brian Mario King. I'm the vice chair of the Arlington Committee 100. I'm actually filling in for Carl the Newkirk tonight. He sends his regards. He's, uh, he said he can join us. But we have a wonderful program this evening, so we're excited about uh, hearing from our, our guests and also getting wonderful questions from the audience. Uh, so let me just jump in. Uh, our first guest is Mr. Terry Clower, uh, Dr. Terry Clower, excuse me. He's the Northern Virginia Chair and Professor of Public Policy at the School of uh, Policy, Government, and International Affairs at George Mason University. He's also the Deputy Director for George Mason University's Center for Regional Analysis. And the center provides economic, housing, and public policy research services uh, and sponsors pri the private, nonprofit, and public sectors. Uh, prior to joining uh, George Mason University, Dr. Clower was the Director of uh, the Center for Economic Development and Research at the University of North Texas. Uh, he will get to benefit from his substantial private industry experience in logistics and transportation management positions, and we look forward to uh, gaining from his experience. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Dr. Carl. Thank you. I'll, uh, I'll get there. I am not going to sing to you. This is not karaoke night. I'm sorry to disappoint you. Yes, I know. It would be a darn sight more pleasant than some of the news I'm about to share. So let's, uh, let's just jump on into it a little bit, if we will. What, we're gonna, what I'm going to talk to you tonight about and give you a little introduction before we get into a discussion back and forth is the state of the regional economy. And then we'll follow that up and have some discussion about what's going on specifically in Arlington County that Ms. Dunn will take care of. But what I want to do is give you an overview of what's happening. Now, as you know, we are coming out of a, the worst recession that we've had since the Great Depression. Uh, and this region actually did fairly well in those early years after the recession, largely because of the stimulus spending that was going on with the federal government. Uh, and we saw that this region appeared to be fairly well insulated to the vicissitudes of the recession in some respects. What we have seen more recently, though, is weakness across many sectors of our economy, and this has had spillover effects that, that I'm going to argue that I'm going to point out to you that are beginning to argue for us to think about do we need to do something different in this region from an economic development perspective than what we have relied on in the past. So let's have a look at some, some numbers. So if we just look at job change numbers overall, what you see there is that effect of the, re the recession down there in the in the red. I am going to use a little pointer here and hopefully not pointing at anybody's eyes or anything, but you'll see that after, you know, in 2010, 2011, 2012, job creation actually kept going. And this, in large respect, was due to direct federal employment as well as, of course, procurement spending by the federal government. Then what we saw in 2013 was sequester and government shutdown, and it started pulling things down. Now, we've seen growth in jobs since then. And so part of your, your, that you're going to be looking at me and saying, well, hang on, we're starting to grow again. The economy, we're creating jobs. Unemployment rate is pretty low in this region. And uh, in northern Virginia, it's running about, oh, maybe 4.8, 5%, something like that below center. So what the heck's the problem? And one of the other things you can tell is, obviously, there's still a lot of damn people on the road in the morning trying to get to work, right? So it's not like you're seeing any real decline in that perspective. But... And again, as I was saying, the unemployment rates are, are fairly low. D.C. is still running above the U.S. average. The U.S. average is that little orange line there across the top. But Northern Virginia, overall, 4.1%, you know, very strong unemployment market. But what we have started to see is a slowdown. The rest of the company, country is starting to perform better than we are. Now, this is April to April numbers, and you see that we're on the bottom half of that, but we see the areas, naturally, I came from the Dallas area, so I left where it was performing well and came up here. And, uh, but, you know, it's Dallas, Seattle performing very well. Houston hasn't done as well in the April time because you actually saw the effects there of the decline in oil prices, as you might expect. Their, their industry is being heavily still tied to oil sector, oil and gas sector. But one of the things that I always tell folks is that if we go back and we look at just 2014, so not the April to April time frame, but just the year 2014, and look at total job creation, if it wasn't for Philadelphia, we would have been at the very bottom. And as you'll notice here, even in this slide, and this is where I make my point, Detroit is doing better than D.C. All right? I'm going to wonder how many more years I can do that and people gasp. You know, and it, it should be a few more years. Federal government, well, here's what's going on in part. The 
federal government is still under sequestration. I do not know yet whether it's going to have another round for fiscal year 2016, uh, but nonetheless, we start to see it. Now, this does not mean necessarily that federal agencies are laying people off, but it's mostly through attrition. But if you start adding these numbers up, these are month-to-month numbers, and we have these months that have been occurring where you've been losing 10 to 15,000 jobs in the federal sector per month. And that starts to have an impact on your regional economy. Again, we're, we're stay, keeping these comments at the regional level. If we look at federal procurement, well, again, this side of the economy exploded up, and some of that was differential of when we started seeing that federal agencies were outsourcing a lot of their work. But nonetheless, these numbers keep going up and up and up through 2010, and that 2008 and 2009, 2010 numbers. But then we start looking at 2011, 2012, 2013. So if you just look at those three years, you drop something in order of a, you know, give or take, about $10 billion you've removed in procurement spending in this region. Now, the good news a little bit is 2014, we saw that number come up a little bit. What we don't know is, is that going to continue to be a trend where we're now starting to rise again, or are we seeing what we might think of as a dead cat bounce, you know, coming along the bottom a little bit, you know, so we just don't know what, what all that's going to mean quite yet. But nonetheless, even at that higher level, we are still down tremendously in terms of, and I mean, we're talking about billions of dollars. And, you know, and as the economist said, you, you know, a billion here and a billion there, and you really pretty soon you're talking about some real money. So now we start looking at some individual sectors and what's been going on. Business and professional services certainly took a big hit during the recession that we see over here in, the, in these areas. And then we see the substantial growth that's going on kind of during that period of time of the Recovery Act spending. And then, of course, you start to see the drawdown. Now, the good news that I really can see here is that we've started to see this sector pick up again a little bit in the first part of this year. So I'm encouraged by that. Again, I'm not sure if it's sustainable. One of the questions still becomes, are we going to enter a sequestration? Will Congress do something to undo sequestration? Will they manage to find a way to work with each other and cooperate? I don't often go to Vegas, but I'm not putting money on it on that one. Uh, building permits? Well, building permits are starting to rise again, but compare this level that we have going on now with what we were doing in the early part of the 2000s. That means there's still a whole lot of activity that we were used to having here, and the jobs that get created out of those sectors not happening. So here when we start looking at the type of jobs by industry and what we compare to what we lost in the recession and what we have gained since then. Now, the number, again, this has been um, the number in professional and business services actually looked pretty rough up until the latter part of 2014 and then into 2000, um, and 2015 so far. But you'll notice that during the recession, we, we lost 24,000 jobs in that sector, so we're actually above. We've caught up and we've actually exceeded now what we lost. Education and healthcare services, we didn't ever really lose a lot, and that has continued to be a strong sector. Retail trade, big gain. Leisure and hospitality, big gain. But then you get into construction, still down. We're still down something in order and construction about, what, 27,000 jobs compared to what we lost in the recession. Financial services is slightly positive now. That's been picking up here recently. Information is still down. Manufacturing is down. Wholesale trade is down. And transportation utilities is about even. But here's the thing that I want to point out to you. If you look here where we've lost about net, we haven't gained back the 10,000 jobs we lost in the recession in manufacturing, but we've gained a lot in retail trading and leisure and hospitality. It takes about five jobs in many, I'm sorry, it takes five jobs in this sec these sectors to make up the economic impact of one job in manufacturing. If you get up here into the financial sector, it's more like a seven to one ratio. So what we are doing is creating jobs not in the right sectors and we're having actually losses in income. If I look more recently, as I was suggesting, these numbers are looking a little bit different in just the last year or so, and I'm very much encouraged by that uh, professional and business services, but again, it's not enough to make up this balance. So if you start talking about we're creating the wrong kind of jobs, 
What does that mean? In fact, for the first time that anybody can measure, the average wages of all jobs in, in the Washington, D.C. region actually declined for three years in a row. 2010, 2011, 2012, and 2013, that period of time, <clears throat> you had year-over-year -year declines. And what has been the result of this? Well, here in Arlington County, from 2009 until 2013, average, <clears throat> excuse me, median household income actually declined about $1,700. Now, that's not a huge drop, but keep in mind that's on average. But look at what's going on in some of your neighboring counties. I mean, Frederick County's gotten hammered. Loudoun County is really taking, taking a hit, if you will, with that. The district has actually done okay because they're attracting the high-income jobs with the millennials that want to go live in the spaces and keeping in mind that, you know, are the millennials going to behave differently than everybody else? And I'd say, well, I'm not sure about that yet. Sorry, trying to tear down the house here. <clears throat> we've seen the impact on housing types uh, of all types. Uh, we've seen that prices have risen. But again, one of the things that I would point to you is that Northern Virginia, which is that kind of light blue line, is still below the peak pricing that you had in 2005, 2006. So you're recovering, but we haven't, I mean, we're several years on. We're, you know, we're almost nine years later and you still haven't recovered in prices yet. The other thing that we're seeing in this economy that we're not used to seeing regionally is actually domestic net out migration. Now, what I mean by that is people that were living here, more of them decided to move than people from within the country decided to come in. Now, you've still had population growth of in the region of about 66,000, uh, but it's been international in migration that has driven that. So we've lost, you know, 20, almost 25,000 people decided that were living here on net decided to leave. And that's something you're just not used to seeing in this economy at all. So what does it mean going forward then? What do we have? Well, this is an index that uh, my colleague, Dr. Fuller, Steve Fuller, uh, developed several years ago that measures the economy. And you can see that it, what this leading index does is actually gives us a picture of what the economy is likely to be doing about six months in the future. So the numbers are positive. They're above the zero line. So that's good. But you'll start to see, though, that thing that I've been talking about, a little bit of caution, you'll notice that it's starting to tick down a little bit. And I don't know if it's going to fall further down at this point, but I'm very much concerned that, again, we're hitting a little bit of a soft spot in our regional economy. <clears throat> so what's our long-term outlook? Well, as you can see, the Washington area, and this is that, that area that when I was talking about that we actually went into recession, in uh, 2013, a combination of sequestration and, of course, the government shutdown drew us down for that year to where we were actually technically had negative growth. And you see that we're growing forward, and then according to our forecast, that sometime in the order of about 2017, 2018, we actually cross over and start performing better in the U.S. again. But let me emphasize that that's just a possibility. And it suggests that there are things that we have to do if we are going to actually realize that possibility. And the news has not been getting any better. Did, did you see the release today that came out about state-level GDP? The, between 2013 and 2014, economic growth in the state of Virginia was zero. And if it wasn't for Mississippi and Alaska, we would be in that position called dead-ass last. Yeah. Um, so, where are we? Well, we're technically growing, but we remain a highly specialized economy. This region is about 40% of all economic activity in this region is tied directly or indirectly to the federal government, either through procurement spending or direct hiring. You are effectively a company town. Just like a mining community in West Virginia, a logging community in Canada or a fishing community up in Nova Scotia or something or another. And unfortunately right now, our company isn't performing that well. A gentleman that I know that many of you are familiar with, Bob Buchanan, has been, you know, talking about Uncle Sugar just isn't delivering like he used to. Uh, and that's very much the case. So part of the question is, what do we need to do? Well, we have some other challenges. 
we're not a lead, we're no longer a leader among the major metro. We can't say that we're great and we're wonderful just because the federal government is spending more def, you know, is make more deficit spending, if you will. Our decline in quality of jobs that I mentioned before, our local fiscal resources are under some strain. Now, I will say that Arlington has seen some property tax. You're not doing this poorly. At, in fact, you're actually doing fairly well in terms of actual valuations compared to the rest of the region. But it's still, you think about what the conversations that you're having in terms of county government, you're not flush with cash, folks, right? Um, this will impact services. This will impact infrastructure. This will impact quality of life. Federal spending should be increasing somewhat because the national economy has been recovering. So that would generate, even if we're not performing as well as the rest of the nation, the rest of the nation is generating more activity and therefore more tax revenue. But again, that also depends on what kind of spending comes out of that. <clears throat> I thought it was very interesting. Last week at GMU, we hosted a gentleman that made his declaration for running for, uh, uh, for president, right? Uh, uh, Governor Chaffee came in. I thought it was very interesting that he was standing in Northern Virginia while he was making this announcement and one of his platforms is to basically cut military spending to the bone. And I was thinking, you know, so welcome to, you know, welcome to Virginia. Let me really decimate your economy. Uh, so what I want to do, is, though, if, as we move forward, this is where we are at. Now, you're probably asking questions now and then, okay, so Flower, where are we needing to go? Well, for that, if you want that answer, you have to stick around for a few minutes because Sally's going to start talking to us about this area, and I'll be back up to answer your questions in a little bit. Thanks so much, Dr. Clower. <clears throat> Our next speaker is Sally Duran. She has served as a, on the Arlington Economic Development Co uh, Commission since 2010 and became the chair, actually, in January 2014. She was a member of the ADC Competitiveness Task Force and uh, developed, that helped develop uh, Arlington's Innovation Economy Strategy Report for the Arlington County Board. She's a longtime Arlington resident and also served on the Virginia Board of Health uh, and was in Leadership Arlington in 2010. Uh, she's a consultant with extensive uh, private sector experience and senior management experience uh, in leading nonprofit health insurance and integrated delivery systems. Uh, thank you, Ms. Heron, for joining us tonight. Good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak before you. I've been in Arlington since I uh, finished college, raised my children here, and so it's um, a pleasure to be able to share what we're doing in the Economic Development Commission. Um, as he said, we started in 2013, early 2013, in a journey of looking at um, the competitiveness state of uh, the county, and we were very concerned, and so we, we did some research, and it parallels pretty closely to what our earlier speaker said, and we presented our findings to the county board, and one of our strategic goals was to come out to the community and start a conversation about Arlington's need to be more innovative and competitive to compete. So I'm delighted to be here tonight and talk to you. So I can figure out the sticker. Okay, we'll be good. Okay. So, so what are our strengths? And, and Arlington, we believe, is a really unique mix. We think it's a remarkable place to live and work because of our values. We, we spent a lot of time at, at the EDC. Actually, we spent three meetings talking about values. We did all the hard work and looked at the econ economics and looked at the strategy and we're going to go into that. And then we came back and said, but what are our values? Because this has to be a partnership. It can't just be about money in Arlington. It has to be about community. It has to be about quality of life. And so we came to kind of some characteristics. We said innovation, quality, fairness, health, education, and prosperity. And we saw that as values that we all share, that we have a common purpose, whether you're working in the school system, you're working in the parks, you know, whatever you're doing, we all want the same things. And we, we wanted to put out to the community, this is our goal, we want to keep it this way, and we need you, the community, to do it together with the business community. So what do we see as our big advantage? Well, we, we have some advantages, but I'm, I'm really glad that our previous speaker kind of laid the groundwork. We do have some, but they're not so great as they used to be. We're kind of in the middle of the pack and we're below Detroit, so that's kind of the bad news. But the great news is we have a very creative and educated workforce. We have the highest percentage of 24 to 34-year-olds in the country. We have the most educated workforce in the country, and we have an innovative business environment, and we're trying to grow it. 
Um, one of the strengths we think for our residents is small town charm and walkability and metro, obviously, cultural assets and um, other amenities. So what do we see as our big, you know, the big hairy goal? It's, it's to maintain a 50-50 split in the commercial and residential share of the tax base. I, I've been to several hearings now, and, and we have wonderful groups in the community. They want more bike paths. They want more dog parks. They want more housing that's affordable. They want everything. Well, we've got to pay for it. And so how are we going to do that? Well, we need to have economic development to pay for it. We have Because we really only have two ways to pay for it. That's property taxes paid by citizens or by the businesses. So our message here is our success and prosperity depends on collaboration between business and residents. This is kind of gives you the picture. We're really blessed in Arlington. We are right now, the split is 52% residential, 48% commercial. It was two or three years ago, 50-50. So we've already moved 2%. And what that means is in the county, the average resident, as you can see on the slide, is paying about $5,775 per year. However, if we were Fairfax, if we were Loudoun, or many communities in the United States, the typical split is actually 70-30. And the citizens here would be paying over $2,000 more a year in taxes. And so we think that the, the citizens in the community want an economic goal of a 50-50 split. And so one of our strategies is to keep that our goal and, and, and try and foster economic development to meet that goal. And it's already kind of been covered, and everyone in this room, I think, already knows this. We were a low-cost alternative for federal governments in the 60s to the 80s. In the 90s to the 2000s, we became what they call value-add. We started to attract a lot of contractors that were supporting the federal government. And then in economic terms, they talk about the classic contractor tail. So that drove a lot of our jobs. Um, as we know, and it's been factually pointed out by our previous speaker, that 2010 beyond, that's not going to work. We, we came up with a phrase, we're calling it the innovation economy. We have to move forward. We have to diversify our, our economy and reduce our dependency on the federal government. We think the place where we have some unique strengths is high tech, cybersecurity, um, also our universities. We are building, particularly in Boston, we've got Virginia Tech, we have GW, we have George Mason, we have Marymount. We're, we're trying to call that University Row. Those universities are partnering with some of the federal agencies and they're doing some fabulous, innovative work that's bringing students to our areas, that's bringing businesses. Um, there's also, that's just one activity that we're, we're working on in the county. Um, this is sort of the same picture in a different way that our previous speaker is showing. It's showing that in Arlington in the last four, four years, we've had three million less in square footage that's been absorbed by businesses. And what does this really mean? Uh, NAFC is a naval area, blah, blah, blah. And then the other is BRAC, which you guys already know, so I can't remember the acronym entirely. But the, the, what's the bottom line? It, what it means is we have a 21% vacancy in the county in the offices. We've never had that big of a vacancy. And then I believe in Roslyn, it's closer to 30% right now. And so what's driving those, what's driving it? Number one, real estate. Our prices are no longer competitive. Um, and there's an increasingly what they call a shadow vacancy rate, and that's the, there's more vacancy within the building than is even apparent to the county. Um, and also what's happening there is we are right now priced too high for GSA to let us have federal agencies in the county. We've exceeded the rental cap. I think it's about $40 per square foot in Crystal City and uh, some parts of Roslyn and Boston are above that cap. One of the reasons we lost the National Science Foundation, we've had fish and wildlife. So in the last four years, we've had a very substantial exit of federal agencies. Uh, and you know, unless we can change some of those dynamics, it's going to be difficult to get them back. The counties had incentives. The counties had a policy of, of not really um, writing any checks or competing um, with the other jurisdictions. The district has, I, I believe it's close to a $50 million, don't quote me on that, but a very substantial um, incentives fund. And we just now are taking, to look, look, taking a look at providing incentives to try and bring businesses into the county. Um, we are known for rules and regulations, and all of us who are federal who have worked in the federal uh, environment, right rules, right regulations, they are very comfortable with them. But in the new tech environment with startups, having excessive numbers of rules and regulations and conditions to do business in the county has made it very difficult for businesses to come in the county 
and they have options. We are also not the only jurisdiction with Metro anymore. There are many choices for where they can go. We're perceived as having our processes lack certainty, lack clarity, and taking too long. Um, perception. Arlington's quality of place, our hipness is losing its edge from business and a media standpoint. As everyone knows, the district is really competing with us with NOMA, DuPont Circle, Columbia Heights, the um, R20-somethings are all wanting to move to the district. When I moved here, we all moved to Arlington because it was considered safer than the district. So the world has changed pretty radically. Um, and the other issue is community and neighborhood. We, there's a perception by the business community that, that we're asking for too much, and there is unreasonable resistance and object in opposition to projects and development. Um, and this is, if you've been through the planning process, frequently can take a very, very long time to get a project approved. That's time and money on the developer's part that they can't afford to spend anymore, and they have other options. So what do we want to do? We want to change our, 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 our strategy, and that's number one, we want to try and embrace the business community and clearly communicate about its value to residents. That's why I'm here. One of the things that the county has done that's been very welcomed is they added an ombudsman last year that's kind of a troubleshooter that's been well received by the business community. If someone's having a particular problem, they can call the ombudsman, so they'll pull together people within the county and try and solve the problem in a very expeditious manner. That's for small business, mid-sized business, any kind of business. And if you talk to the chamber, they'll tell you some very good stories about their members being really pleased with the change in attitude and the success of that program. Second thing is easy processes. We have to transform Arlington's development process to meet the needs of user by making them more efficient and predictable. Right now, the Planning Commission's been doing some work on looking at the site plan review processes. We have a new uh, person in the planning department for the county, and he's also looking at processes. I think this is this is starting. You know, more work is going to have to be done, but there's definitely a mindset that this is a critical um, strength that the county has to have. We need to be better, faster, and quicker than the other jurisdictions to remain competitive in a world-class environment that we're competing in. Um, third is competitive intelligent infrastructure. Um, we're trying to invest in resources for this, and this goes back to supporting the universities, supporting some of the agencies like DARPA and others that are kind of brain trusts and drive new technology and new products that move from the military side to the private sector. Um, innovation economy, again, we're looking at the zoning requirements. We're trying to encourage smart and creative uses of commercial space. I believe down in Crystal City, there's a new building that's going to kind of have micro housing units, and they're going to be interspersed in a building that's doing um, both uh, residential and commercial activities. So we're kind of looking at a different way of using spaces. Even your schools, you have you know schools, business, community spaces. How can we have them be more multi-use instead of just for one purpose? Um, and then with that, we're talking about economic ecology. We want to foster these uh, fast growth companies. One of the things that we have here in the county is Tandem and SI. It's a public-private partnership to promote the growth of tech companies, and the county provides some funding. We just got some additional matching funds from the state um, government. Our, government. our governor was very supportive of it, and so that's another um, activity that's going on to try and um, promote uh, new businesses. Um, messaging, we want to promote Arlington as a world-class community. Um, one of the things that's happening that uh, Victor, our new uh, head of economic development, is doing is uh, he had a, a large number of Chinese business leaders come. They had Mary Hines. They worked with the district. They rented a boat and went down the Potomac and tried to explain to them our proximity to our nation's capital and that we want these businesses to invest. The other thing that's happened in the last year or two, which sounds like maybe not so significant as is, but we've got the Air China is coming directly to Dulles Airport. It turns out that for a lot of Asian countries and other countries, unless the flight goes directly into that, that place, like Dulles, they're not going to come here. They're going to go to New York. They're going to go to other places. So if we can have direct flights by... Asian companies into Dulles that will drive more international travel, international business. So the um, economic development uh, depart uh, department is trying to work on fostering more international um, airline traffic to Dulles, which is an example where we're trying to cooperate regionally, but it also benefits Arlington, it benefits everyone. Um, so what are we doing? 
talking about it, we're messaging, we're developing some metrics, and one of the more interesting things we did was uh, the future office mark, and then we supported funding for the county budget. Um, there's a study, and I can make it available to Jeannie so that you can have it. We spent about a year looking at what's the new environment. What's the bottom line? In the future, people aren't in offices. They're going to use 25% square footage. They're hoteling. So what does that mean? Okay, it means that if a company in the future has a lease, they're probably going to use 25% less space. They also don't want 10-year leases. They want five-year. They want two. They want bare-bones uh, space design. It's a completely different world, and all of that means that we need to rethink our processes because they don't want to spend two years on a process for a two years lease, and we need to be much more innovative to be competitive. Um, we talked about this. We have a 21% vacancy. What does that translate to? It trans if we had an increase by 10% in the office vacancy, we would go. It would represent 34 million dollars in local tax revenue. And what does that mean? That's about the cost of building a new school. And right now we're adding 1,000 students a year to our school system, and we have to fund that. In my understanding, we have about 48 trailers already in the county, and one way to solve this problem or work on this problem is to fill the buildings to help generate and community benefit for the community. Um, we would have to fill 4.4 million square feet of office space to reach 10%, and the entire region is projected to add 3.6 million per year over the next two years. So what are we going to do about that? Well, if Victor were here and he's coming in September, he would have a, a pardon? Next, yeah, sometime in the fall, he would talk about the Blue Ocean Strategy. So I will. Um, what, what the Blue Ocean Strategy means, and we right now are what they would call a heavily red strategy. We are competing with many other fish in the same ocean. If we want to move forward, we need to find new markets to um, bring businesses in, which means going international and going outside of our region to bring in new, new competition. So what are we doing next? Well, the Economic uh, Development Commission learned that Arlington County, relative to the other counties, we're spending about $3.3 million on trying to generate economic development. And in contrast, you can see that the third district is at $36 million. Fairfax County is at $6 million. Even Prince William is at two point three, And Fairfax... Are, Fairfax includes 27 revenue-dedicated FTEs, nine are international, and four are throughout the United States. We haven't been doing anything like that. So um, what happened? Um, the Economic Development Commission asked and the, the, uh, economic, for the board to support uh, the Economic Development Department in their FY uh, 2016 budget, and they did. We were very pleased that we got so much support. We added 600000 for business development, 300000 for marketing, 200000 for tandem, and 200000 for tourism promotion. Um, and then, as you can see, the estimated return on investment is 630 square feet, 1,800 jobs, and 900000 in local revenue. We're estimating it would take six, six to seven years um, to get us back on track where we want to be um, in terms of filling the vacancies, and that's going to take a continuous stream of money from the county to try and support these efforts. Um, one of the things you, you may or may not know is Arlington is the gateway for Virginia tourism. We are the number one destination that people come to visit other parts of Virginia, and we generate an ex a pretty substantial amount of money at this, for the state um, through tourism. And so I've just got, got a couple slides left, and I'm trying to stay on time. What, what is our other strategy? Regionalism. We think it's time to reinvent, reinvent ourselves. We're looking at third spaces, creative spaces, unique experiences, urban villages. I don't know if you've all been to Crystal City or Rosin lately, but there's something going on every night. Whether it's a 5K race, uh, something beers, barks for dogs and people. I mean, just unbelievable, trivial pursuit. Anything you want to do is going on somewhere. And they're really enlivening the street and making it attractive for all age groups. Um, so what do we want from the Committee of 100? We want you to embrace our business community and communicate loud and clear about its value to your members, your friends, and our community organizations. Secondly, we want to, to change to a culture of we. We feel like there's been kind of a divide between the business and the residents and the county, and that has to stop. Um, as our previous speaker showed, there's no time for that. We all need to work together. We may have to make some compromises. We need to listen to each other. And we have to move forward as a community. And thirdly, uh, which dovetails with that, we want to work collaboratively. 
We want to have fair solutions to improve the efficiency of Arlington's development processes. And finally, here's our vision. Um, Carly Farina was at George Mason uh, about a year and a half ago, and she said this was what she told us, and we think we should do it. Take advantage of the talent, the companies, the community, and opportunities to build an innovation economy that is number one in this region and world class. And that's what we want to do. Um, and we want to retain our community values. We want to be a place where residents and businesses together equal Arlington's success and prosperity. I boil it all down to small town charm, big city amenities. I think that's what we all want, and that's what we have to work for. So I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Invite our, our guests to answer questions. If folks have questions, and Lynn and Timon are going to help us with the mic. Just give them a second to get set up. If you have a question, you can get a mic. Um, I was just curious about manufacturing it down to nothing. Or it went down. What is manufacturing in Washington D.C.? What were you referring to? Well, what we I think I've got a mic here. Um, well, what we what the data is showing is the recovery of the cost. It doesn't mean that there's no manufacturing, but there is not yet manufacturing in D.C. made by 3D printers. Did you know that? Um, now, and the thing that and thing that I tell, and not so much for you guys, but the thing that I tell some of the counties that are out a little bit further, you know, say Prince William or some of those, is one of their opportunities in the future is for those kind of companies, when they decide to scale up, if they're successful in tar scale up, are you going to scale up manufacturing operations in the district? No you're going to have to move out. But what you do is you keep your design in. What you guys need to do in something like that is be the design shop. You don't have the green space to start talking about building million square foot distribution centers and, and uh, manufacturing facilities. And it's, it's not going to happen here. You don't, you, the costs are too high. But we are not in this region manufacturing a lot. I don't see that as something in the core of the region as being an opportunity in the future. I think it can be an opportunity, but it's more, again, you know, Loudoun County, Stafford County, those kind of areas are the ones that have the land and the space to, to expand it. The good news, though, is most manufacturing that is going to occur in this country are going to have high value added design processes supporting their operations, and that's what you want to have in the core of the region. And if you could uh, state your name before you uh, ask your question. Or Okay, I'm Ann Page, and I wanted to ask um, what the county can do to encourage some of the developers, like Monday Properties, or the companies that are building the large buildings, to lower their ta their uh, rental rates so that they can compete with Dyson's Corner and Reston and other areas where metros go, and you know. It seems that the county would have to have some kind of incentive for these developers who are taking major risk. Some of their buildings are empty and have been for years, and they've spent lots of money on them. One of the things that we're trying to do is really have a different kind of conversation because of that exact point. I think in the past, the county has um, had a, required a tremendous number of conditions and also community benefits, and so it's made it made it's forced them to add to the cost of rents to be viable. And so we need to streamline the business requirements and make it easier for them to do business in the county for them to offer more affordable rents. 
And one of the real challenges though, that I'd point out though is for these folks, if their building has been empty for a substantial amount of time or is actually, it may still be listed as class A office space, but it's 10, 15 years old, it likely doesn't have the internal infrastructure that companies now are demanding. If you're getting by with fewer people. So the point is, is there, there's a lot of space. There's space out in Tyson's that really needs to be from an economic perspective shifted use away from office use because it's no longer a competitive office place just because of the internal infrastructure. Yeah, regarding the, the role you could say your name before Ted Sachs, <laughs> the role of uh, balance between developers and current rents, it, when you talk about what the county demands, but what they have been demanding is green space for people to actually play and rather than paving everything over, affordable housing contributions, which are among the smallest in the nation, and numerous other things. The, the total percentage of those things is very small, but you've got large developers who come in and are still demanding the high rents that they thought they could get 10 years ago just because they want to, rather than either renovating the spaces uh, as they're trying to do in Crystal City and bring them up the scale from C, B to A, or renting them at the current B, C rates. But instead, they're inflexible in asking more and more of the county, less and less park space that come at the expense of the citizens. So the question really is, why aren't the developers and the property owners kicking in their share to try to make themselves more competitive? Because, I mean, BRAC basically decimated a good portion of it. But that only took care of the older units. The newer stuff is coming in, and it doesn't seem to me they're really competing. They're seeming holding out. So I was just curious about your response to that. My understanding is that it's become extremely expensive to do business in the county and go through the site process, and there are other options, and so people are looking at developing in other areas outside the county, and I, but beyond that, I'd have to do some research on the fact. I can't exactly explain why the rents are so high. That's a very specific question. I can, yeah, I'll, I'll add in a couple of things, and I would take, you know, I would argue with you a little bit in a most friendly way that, that I think you are incorrect if you're saying that developer contributions in this community, in this particular, in Arlington County, are lower than what they do in the nation. In fact, you are a very high cost of business for the developers. I can because remember when you start competing for non-federal type of businesses, you're no longer competing with Maryland. You're competing with Arizona, with Texas, with Alabama, with Florida. And I can tell you that compared to those, you folks are damned expensive in what you expect. The other side to yeah, and, and the other side to it is quite simply understand that these folks that are doing the development, they have to borrow money to do it, and the folks that are wanting them to, or loaning them money, just like you exhibit, if any of you have been through the nightmare of getting a mortgage recently, it's tough to make a deal pencil out. And so, it, you know, and, and that's one of the things that even comes within the incentive programs is that most time incentive programs will help you at the margins, but it won't make a bad deal good. And so I would say in this case, it's one of reaching out. It is a matter of what, what Sally is talking about makes a lot of sense. It's a matter of image. If you get a reputation of being unfriendly to business, it takes a long time to recover. Even after you become very, very business friendly, it takes a long time to recover that reputation. Because, you know, they'll just say, oh, gee, why do I want to do that? Jerry Gordon's happy to talk to me over in Fairfax or the folks out in Loudoun and Wharton and not to mention Prince William, you know, so it is a it is a challenge. Over here.
So, uh, I'll take, no, yeah, I'll take, uh, sure, that's fine. Thank you. Um, what I would say, is, first of all, is that there's a little bit of a mixture in your question between national scale and local scale. So it's not just what's going on at the at the local scale. But from a national perspective, when you talk about overall economic growth, you mentioned two percent, and you're absolutely spot on with that. You know, within a little bit here or there, our economy in the United States, we are the most productive economy in the world, and it is our long-term term strength. We do a better job of creating, disseminating, and adopting technologies in our business practices. Unfortunately, many of those technologies are labor-saving technologies. So between population growth, whether it's natural immigration, and technology change, we have to be growing our economy nationally at about 2% just to mean a steady state for employment demand. It, you know, it varies a little bit. I'm speaking in broad terms. I do not expect us to approach 4 or 5% economic growth anytime in the future because I think before it got to that level, you'd have the feds really tapping on the brakes in terms of interest rates. But what does it mean in terms of spillover? What it means here is that you either have to presume that the federal government is going to get back into a mode of trillion dollar a year deficits or they're going to have to have the economy grow across multiple sectors. And one of the things that's been a little bit different about this re recovery, it has been driven more than the last four recessions based on manufacturing activity. Export-driven manufacturing. Exports have, re have represented about 12% of our recovery. But unfortunately right now, if you look at the manufacturing indices and things like that here recently, our manufacturing production is going way down because the dollar has gotten so strong. If you wanted to think about going to Europe, it's been over a decade since our exchange rate has been this positive. Unfortunately, that just means that for Europeans, our goods cost about 30% more than they did two years ago. So we're seeing a slowdown in that part of our economy that actually was doing pretty well. And interestingly enough, it was manufacturing. Um, yes, there's actually several things that the Economic Development Department has been already working on. Number one, we're very blessed to have a staff member who speaks Mandarin Chinese, and she recently went to China on our behalf and uh, went, to, went to some activities there and was involved with speaking with well over 100 companies, and we're trying to strengthen that partnership with Chinese companies. Secondly, there are four or five major trade shows that bring in thousands of business, one of which is in Boston, I believe, South by Southwest, mm -hmm. which um, we just, for the first time, Arlington sent representatives to that event. There were two or three other events that Arlington sent both economic development staff and the, the Roslyn bid, Crystal City bid, um, also sent uh, representatives, and they've been very cost-effective. Instead of paying for their own booth, they partnered with local companies and bids and shared those booths so they had both the government and private sector working together to talk to companies to bring them to Arlington. So because of the funding they got from the county government, they've been able to do substantial outreach to get to what we're calling that blue ocean, reach out to new markets and new companies, and that's an aggressive part of the strategy to try and fill that vacant office space, not by competing locally, but by bringing new business to the county. You know, and, she, and Sally brings up a very good point, but there are, and, and one of her slides actually did a good job of starting to really illustrate this. When you're talking about economic development, there are three components to it. There's business attraction, like she's talking about, going out and getting folks to come here. And you guys have, his, have over the last several years not done real well at that. If you look between 2000 and 2013, Arlington County employment is down about 8% net in terms of looking at the companies moving in versus the companies moving out. So you've got to put some emphasis on this to try to, to rebalance that. You had about 13, 11 to 13% growth in existing businesses expanding. And I would argue to you that that is your number one opportunity. You guys have probably at some point seen my former governor, Perry, unfortunately presidential candidate, uh, coming out again and you know, coming up here and do, running advertisements, you know, come to Texas, you know, we will help you do, we're all across business. The, the legislature in Texas gave the governor a rolling fund of $200 million to go chase companies with. And Texas is certainly a low-cost place to do business and very friendly regulatory processes, and we do a very good job of attracting firms to that state. However, in total number, if you look in the long term, 
about 75% of all jobs created in Texas come from the existing businesses expanding. It's that other part where it was mentioned as retention, but it's more than retention. It's working with the companies that are here. I've argued to you that the costs are pretty high to do some things here, right? Well, the folks that are here have already acknowledged that. They're here because they want to be here. I'll use a Texas phrase for you. Dance with the one that brung you. <laughs> you know, and, and, and so I think that there are real opportunities to find out that it's here. And it's not necessarily going to be federal government. As you say, your costs have gotten above that. The other side of federal government, though, is don't they get tax exemptions? I'd much rather have that private sector company be in there who's going to actually be paying the taxes. Right? Now, it's, you know, and that does not mean that federal government employment is valueless, but it's one that between the two, you want, you want to be in this plan. Okay. Start over. My name is Gail Dennis, and I wondered if such things at think building and farms. Um, We're having a little trouble hearing the question. Gail, could you? School facilities. Some more. Is there a committee that comes can, can come up with more creative ideas than just expanding the current businesses? Maybe into something that traditionally would take place in an urban environment like hydro, like what like water. Um, but something like that that could be used for all of these buildings that are sitting over there in Crystal City vacant. Maybe okay. generate right. more taxes. Let me, Thank I'm, I'm going to, and let me, if you will, if I get this a little bit wrong, certainly correct me, but for those that couldn't hear what she was talking about, she was talking about alternative uses, and she mentioned, like, you know, maybe even hydroponic farming and all of that kind of stuff. So I guess what I could flippantly say is, well, you know what, your neighbors have legalized marijuana, why don't you guys grow it? Um, <laughs> but, but aside from that, uh, you know, the, the issue, though, becomes is many of these very innovative uses that we talk about, the cutting edge, leading edge, are these cutting edge things where the profit margins aren't really good yet. And because the profit margins aren't very good, they can't afford it, and you wind up with looking at alternatives. Now, it, it becomes a challenge to think of what else can you do with the building. I mean, one of the things that I've heard been talked about in, say, Tyson's, where they, in Fairfax County has an over 20% uh, vacancy rate as well, is they need, a, they need some better affordable housing. Not affordable, but workforce or uh, housing that folks can afford, working, working families can afford. Why not convert some of this office space to residential space? Well, it sounds like a good idea until you start putting the numbers to how much it costs to take something that was designed as a commercial building and turn it into something that's livable. Uh, you know, it's, it's a very expensive process, and then it becomes, well, how much is government willing to do it? Because, for one, the, the, the banks are not going to lend a developer money to do that if they're going to create something that's a below market rent. They're just not going to sign off on the loan. So, but having said that, I, I do agree with you that it's going to take many different avenues to address this some of which may be repurposing buildings. And I tell you what, you've got a certain class of office building in this market that the absolute best thing that you could do is tear the bloody thing down. But then you have to get the cooperation because, you know, I can, I can take you to many places where you'll have a family ownership of a building that's been in the family for the third generation and it's been sitting empty, but, you know, they've got deep enough pockets so they can just let it sit there. Uh, that's a great question. There's actually two things that have been going on. Number one, as I alluded to in the presentation, is the future of the office market tries to look at exactly that question. It's a great report. I can make it available to Jeannie so you all can look at it, but it, it talks about multi-use buildings. It talks about integrating work and living and different kinds of uses in, in, in buildings in the future to attack that exact issue. The second thing is Mary Hines is leading a community facilities study task force and that group is also trying to relook at our strategy for 
facilities and, and get at that question. But I think the, the office market uh, study, there's also a really great video. Um, we went out and we talked to Opower and some of the, and we had a, a representative from GSA on the task force. So we really had some different kinds of businesses view their, um, give us their views on how Arlington can be innovative and cutting edge and look at buildings in a completely different way. And so I think you would all find that very, very helpful and a thoughtful um, study of this exact issue. I think we have time for one or two more questions. Anyone would like to get a question in? Oh, yes. Um, Uh, I'm Joan McDermott, and I think it was you, Sally, that said that the site plan review process is uh, described as being cumbersome and taking too long. What would you like to see change to improve it? Um, any suggestions? Um, I think there's actually some things under underway. There's some new leadership in the planning department. Um, Steve Culver has come from Madison, Wisconsin, and he's working closely with the Planning Commission to look at ways that they can make the processes more innovative. The Planning Commission itself has undertaken some um, work on uh, some site plan review processes for certain kinds of projects that they could get through much more quickly if they met certain um, conditions. And I think there are some places already, in, there are some baby steps in place to make those processes less cumbersome. And I, I think we need to let those people do their, their work in that front, front, and the Economic Development Commission will support those efforts. Last question. Right. We want to thank our speakers tonight. Thank you for joining us. It was a fascinating conversation. As a parting gift, we do want to give you a Committee 100 pen that uh, <laughs> we hope you'll treasure for many years to come. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the theme of an innovation economy, I want to encourage everyone to visit our website, maybe uh, pay your membership dues for next year, uh, <laughs> buy dinner cards for next year. This concludes our uh, 2015 program year, but we look forward to exciting FY, uh, program year 16. Uh, and we'll also be at the Arlington uh, County Fair uh, July 6th through 9th, I believe. Five, I'm sorry, August 5th through 9th, uh, August 5th through 9th. Uh, so please check out our booth there and all the other great vendors. Uh, and thank you again for joining us. Have a good night.